Good afternoon, Dr. Kumar, Samir. Great to be here. I don't know if I am taking the floor before you. Or it's, it's, it's your show. <laughs> it's our show. It's our our show. show. Actually, I'm very pleased to open this uh, conference that we organized with the uh, Ob Observer Research Foundation um, to discuss the very important topic. And I want to recognize Mr. Ramesh. Uh, I think you were part of this incredible uh, journey to get some of the agreements that we have now in the table, but also welcome, of course, uh, Dr. Kumar, who has been a key actor in this uh, discussion about uh, climate and growth. Um, uh, this discussion, in Investing in Low Carbon <coughs> India, is organized, as I said, jointly by the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development and the Observer Reserve Foundation, and it will be followed by a dinner later tonight and a conference tomorrow. Governments across the world need to address the challenge of ensuring inclusive growth and improving well-being while addressing climate change. And it sounds, it's just one line that I said, inclusive growth, well-being, and climate. But that's the name of the challenge, and I think that's the way we need to put it together because we need another kind of growth. And that's why it's so difficult, because we need to exert change and we need to exert leadership. And last year, when chairing the G20, Chancellor Merkel asked the OECD to produce the report Investing in Climate, Investing in Growth, and I'm gonna make some promotional, it's here. Um, and I have Anthony Cox, who is the Director of Environment, and all of his colleagues, and Irene Ors. Uh, the whole purpose of this report, as Chancellor Merkel put it, was to develop the business case, to get a way of a framing of whether investing in climate was a cost that was preventing economies to growth, whether uh, achieving the climate objectives was putting too much pressure in our economies and therefore it was impossible to do it. We just need to develop first and then we try to fix whatever is broken. And I think what this report is was to say is not only possible, is not only feasible, is the only way. Is the only way to incorporate the climate considerations to our growth model. And I think the good news about the report is that uh, it confirms that you can get both. You can get achievement in the low carbon economy, but also achievement and growth. And let me tell you that Chancellor Merkel asked us to produce this report because we wanted to convince some of the members around the table that were not uh, very comfortable with the Paris Agreement to see if we could convince them, but it seems that we failed in that attempt. But in any case, this is a very good report and I hope you will be uh, looking forward to uh, um, discussing it and looking forward to uh, see how we can advance these great challenges that we are all confronting. And this uh, report also provides policymakers with guidance on how to transition to a low carbon economy while ensuring uh, near term economic employment and well being benefits. As I said, it confirms that it is possible. It confirms, actually, it puts light in one element, which I don't think we always include in the equation, which is the damage that can be created to the economy if we do not consider the climate considerations. I want to congratulate India on the strong progress made across various policies to support the transition to a low carbon economy while achieving growth, whether to the ambitious target to achieve 175 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2022, which India is actually likely to surpass, or through the progress with green fiscal policies by strengthening carbon pricing and continuing to reform fossil fuel subsidies. There are opportunities for India to go even further, building on this strong progress, and I look forward to discussing it later tonight and, to, and during tomorrow's conference. The, the work of the OECD in climate, including this report, advocates in particular a whole of government approach to achieve low carbon growth. Nothing wrong with environmental ministers, Mr. Ramesh, but I think that you need all the help that you can get in terms of engaging the finance, the economics, the uh, innovation, uh, the engineering sector, all and in, and in a very strong stakeholder approach. And that's why we are so um, proud to have with us and to introduce Dr. Rajiv Kumar, who is the vice chairman of NITI Ayong, which is a critical stakeholder in this effort in uh, India. 
I know that uh, you don't need uh, in a lot of introductions, doctor, but let me just say that uh, he has worked in government, in academia, in industry, and in multi and multinational institu multilateral institutions. A founding director of PAL India Foundation, he has been, uh, he has held numerous positions, including CEO of the Indian Council for Research and International Economic Relations, and Chief Economist at the Confederation of Indian Industries. So great to have you here, Dr. Rahib. I need to do something for the media, which is to deliver the report to you, and you need to stand and shake my hand. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I will ask then, it's for you. <laughs> and now I will ask uh, Samir to conduct the discussion with uh, Dr. Kumar. I think uh, we can all agree that was a very sophisticated and, and, and compelling pitch for the OECD report uh, this evening. Um, I'm not going to pitch any ORF work, except I'm going to embed, the, embed our work in the questions I'm going to post to you. You very kindly agreed to take some questions this evening before we move to the headline panel in, in the next 10 to 15 minutes. But, uh, you know, we uh, have been following this sector for a while, sir. And recently, in your own, own Indian Economic Survey for 2017, you have uh, you know, uh, estimated a 526 billion uh, infrastructure investment gap in terms of uh, India's requirements. Now, uh, when we uh, were investigating the commitment of various stakeholders, we felt that the financial sector in India, and certainly across the world, was least committed uh, towards the SDG and the climate agenda. Uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis other stakeholders. Uh, what is, um, as, the, as a chief thinker for this government, how are you uh, trying to bring together this whole framework of the banking and financial community to respond to this big gap that you have asserted in terms of our infrastructure gap? Well, uh, thanks, Amir, and uh, great uh, pleasure, privilege to be here. Feel this is, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, this is what sometimes your official position uh, gets you to do, to feel like an interloper. Uh, between the people like Jairam Ramesh and Mr. Sanalal Kadwai, who has spent much more time than I have done on this issue. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, maybe I don't want to wish to stay much long, too long between the audience and them and the panel, the high panel. Uh, but but um, let me start off by saying that, you know, in the first time, the first uh, uh, K. B. Lal Memorial Lecture that I had organized for ICRIA, uh, Larry Summers was the speaker. And Larry Summers had come here and said that, look, uh, we were talking about at that time environment. I believe the first uh, meeting of uh, you know the first uh, not the Paris, you know the first meeting was being held, and he had said that look uh, you know everybody is talking about all these financial uh, things etc cetera, etc, cetera, but I am sure uh, he said almost he I am sure that the that the developed economies will not put the money where the mouth is. They'll keep urging where the you know where where the and and I was taken aback because he had, you know just uh, just stepped down as the Treasury Secretary at that time, if I remember correctly, and I said, how can that be? And I find still that, you know, um, you know the commitment is, uh, uh, you know, uh, from the OECD economy, it is a huge amount, you know, that they've said that 100 billion will come our way, et cetera, et cetera, but I don't think more than 50 has yet been, uh, you know, committed or earmarked. So given that, I think we in the emerging economies will have to, in some sense, fend for ourselves and fend for ourselves in the sense that not depend upon official flows uh, you know, for this, but to look at the vast private sector flows that are there and create opportunities for them. Because as uh, I think as uh, Mr. Ramos said, uh, there isn't a trade-off. And if there is one, we should remove that perception and address that trade-off between uh, being green and having infrastructure growth. I think we can do that. And give me, let, and, and giving you, let, to give you an example, uh, we in Niti have just started working actually quite uh, actively on uh, waste to energy projects. Now all the municipal waste that you can have is can be converted and now there are two Indians actually, one out of Seattle and the other out of I think Minneapolis who have now developed a technology where they use uh, staged uh, raise, rise in temperature and go up to plasma levels to incinerate basically all the municipal waste of all kinds and then to produce uh, ethanol from it which can then be used to generate, you know, to get. So th th that's the sort of thing, you know, uh, or for example, in agriculture that we've just now figuring out 
that there are ways where you can reduce the inputs, you know, the, the chemical inputs. And I believe President Macron has just signed a, signed and signed an order, signed a, made a law that France will become, uh, you know, will 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 stop using inorganic chemicals in its agriculture. Now if we start doing that and improve our agriculture, you know, um, you know, sort of uh, productivity by using improving water, retaining quality of the soil, retaining carbon content, we can get that. But in, you know, infrastructure, we in India, and I just want, I want to make this announcement in some sense, a plug, that we are holding a big uh, global uh, mobility summit on 7th and 8th of September, which is led by the Prime Minister himself. And I'm saying this simply because when you have this mobility and you have zero emission, you know, sort of uh, vehicles, and not just that, but you know, you are using all the, uh, you know, big data, the, you know, the, the the, the digital part, the you know shared mobility, the connected mobility, the multimodal, all of this is infrastructure, but all of this offers huge opportunities for investment, for private investment. You know, and then here because you know we are going to be in India focusing much more on you know public transport than private transport because we want to you know switch away from a U.S.-based transport model, you know, which is private transport based. Now here is a here is a very good example of how you can have green and infrastructure and yet you know, not be dependent on foreign flows. So that's one side of it. The other part of it, of course, is that you know, do we need, how do we create the instruments or the capabilities? Now there, I am afraid we are, our financial sector, uh, I've just been uh, discussed, uh, you know, with me was Rasey Shah, who is the chairman of the Edelweiss, and he himself admits that our financial sector is not up to the mark, actually, at this time. And we need to develop those advisory capabilities. We dev need to develop institutional investment bodies. You know, we can, uh, you know, we can uh, uh, th th think about having, getting much, many, much more, you know, sort of uh, assets under our management. So there is a, and especially for the credit markets. So that's where a lot of foreign funds uh, can flow, that if we can deepen, I just found out two days ago that our total debt to GDP ratio is I think about one sixth not external debt, you know, total debt to GDP ratio is about a sixth of what China has. And, 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 you know, and similarly for other countries, much less than the, you know, Japan, et cetera. So can we improve our gearing ratios by, you know, by, by, by you know, non-risk, you know, prudential means, you know, and, and, and open up the financial sector so that we can invite the financial flows, which will be attracted to green infrastructure you know, possibilities which are opening up now because of the new technology. You know, whether it's zero emission, or whether it's green energy, or whether it's municipal and so on. So I'm saying that you got the demand here, you got the possibilities, you need the financing, and for financing there is sufficient resources out there, but we need to create the instrumentality uh, to get them, to get them into our country. But sir, domestic flows are not going to uh, pass muster by themselves. You will certainly need international flows, and there is a new uh, mood of prudentialism that is uh, restricting certain kind of risks that emerging technologies and emerging geographies, in a sense, have implicitly embedded in them. And in that sense, conversations around solvency, around the Basel norms, uh, are where we also need to be present. Is there a realization uh, in this government that India now needs to be uh, influencing some of these key conversations that uh, create the regulatory ecosystem which can either enhance or impede flows towards um, I think I think um, it's uh, I mean this is the sort of thing that I had to get into when I was for a brief while on the board of the RBI and we looked at all the Basel norms etc and so on you know and the in my view actually uh, even for a for a country like India where 70 percent of your banking is sovereign and backed by sovereign guarantee do you need 13 percent of tier one capital is a question that you ask. Or do you need uh, a cash reserve ratio of six, seven percent? You know, because both those things are highly restrictive, and these come at a time when emerging economies probably now need maybe you know uh, some people say you know uh, you know more than sort of uh, you know more than a four trillion dollars now for the infrastructure development, and you know they need as much cash as they can get. So therefore, I think there is there is a strong argument here. There is a strong argument of here, argument here to uh, look, review. Uh, the Basel norms, you know, because uh, <coughs> they will otherwise restrict our own, you know, the, you know, the, the credit, you know, the credit to GDP ratio in India is so low at the moment. And how you, how would you raise it if your commercial banks are bound hand and foot 
by the strong Basel norms being enforced, you know, um, in, a, in a hawkish manner by the central bank. So uh, one, we have to we have to get into these uh, discussions uh, at the Basel committee uh, and and get into and, and, and try and get them to review this because I think uh, the you know the the, the impact uh, of the uh, what I call the Atlantic uh, you know pan Atlantic financial crisis, which is 2008. So it's not, it, was, it wasn't a global crisis, so I'm trying to you know, restrict it to that. The impact of that ending up in restricting credit mobilization in the emerging economies, I think is a, is, is a very uh, you know, unfortunate negative externality for us. The other thing, of course, is that you know, having said that is that, well, if that, if, if that remains as it is, then you need to maybe think about how you want to uh, you know, maybe replace some of the requirements by green financing, that if a country or if a bank is using credit to finance green mm. growth, or if a country is uh, devoting n percent of its credit expansion uh, to inf green infrastructure or to green energy, then they will carry a lower risk premium uh, than what you do. You see, because after all, all of these things are, you know, these ratios So risk are discounting for investment. Risk discounting for green investment. Mm. That's the sort of thought that one had. Uh, so those are the two things. But I think the first one is, is, is perhaps more important because the emerging economies must get their voices heard about you know, less restrictive uh, credit regime. Given that they have, uh, you know, they, can, they can maintain the same prudential norms uh, better in some sense than what they've done in the past. So uh, we, in, in the course of our work, uh, a long grant that we had from MacArthur Foundation two years, we have also been hosting small conversations in, in European and, and American uh, centers, financial centers. One of the uh, confessions of a, of a big uh, asset management company in London was that our chairman has said we will uh, you know, deploy so much of our, uh, 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 of our assets towards the green uh, uh, growth and green infrastructure segments, yet our ability to implement uh, the intentionality of the top management remains quite weak simply because the people who are making the project call either don't know how to assess uh, the emerging market uh, landscape or the risk associated with these new technologies. And they said there is an issue of a capacity gap in Europe. So while we deploy a lot of money to build capacities in, in the southern hemisphere, there is perhaps time to build capacities at home so that we can assess projects in a different way. Do you think this is, there is an there is a, uh, opening here for uh, big markets like India to actually invest in capacity building in Europe? Is it time to, to reverse the flow? <laughs> you know, the question itself is amazing, and I hope more and more uh, top honchos of the global financial world ask that question, whether there is a bias against emerging economies in the way they lend, in the way they handle their credit. Because you know, this, uh, if you look at all you know, sort of portfolios of a lot of investment funds, hedge funds, et cetera, uh, you will find that the emerging markets are very often underweighted, you know, I mean, they're overweighted, because you know, they sort of you know, feel that you know, they should invest less, and, a very small percentage of these are directed towards emerging economies, and uh, it, it's it's an abs it's it's a great. I mean, I, I, what an amazing uh, confession and what a true uh, true confession, which is that they there is they, they do not have the capabilities of uh, judging our realities here in the manner that they should be ju they should be judged. Uh, so therefore, they need to build capacity. Uh, they need to build capacity, but for us to help them do it, I think is a bit of a stretch. They should pay for to doing and, and building that capacity by hiring and engaging a lot more professionals uh, from our economies into their credit risk and credit management and then their credit assessment, uh, you know, department. But I think if they do, they will find that the that the ratio that the weight that they've assigned to many of these economies like India and China and you know and other other you know, other African countries is much too low. It's far too low, and I don't see why this continues to happen. In fact, I, I, I very often, you know, ma, you know this, this so-called flight to safety mm. of this capital, you know, of the portfolio capital that you know that you know we keep talking about that you raise uh, the Fed raises or talks about raising interest rates by you know 20 basis points, and that seems to be a rush out of the door for all eco economies. I think it's just uh, it, it, to me it shows one of course uh, you know herd mentality, and two actually the very low uh, you know capability. Mm -hmm of people who are handling vast amounts of money and who are sort of, you know, have you know, trillions of dollars of 300 trillion dollars of asset under management without uh, the, you know, without, uh, you know, as much 
uh, knowledge of the investment opportunities in these emerging economies. But this is where I, Ramos, OECD could help in a very big way. So the OECD would help, uh, you know, we will have, a, have an objective for itself uh, to, to, to make sure that the, 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 the weights that are assigned to the emerging economies in the portfolios of very large investment hedge and pension funds, especially the last, the pension funds, are those weights are in sync with what the investment opportunities really are in the emerging world. I think the OECD will do a great service uh, to its, uh, to the, you know, to, to overall global capital, but also to green capital. So that is when you will find more coming, you know, coming our way uh, than, you know, and into schemes which are, which are, which are, which are incredible and, the, and, and because the new technology has opened up so many potential uh, open, you know, uh, sort of uh, investment opportunities which these uh, fund managers don't recognize. And, you know, and, 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 and I think it's time that they did, but, uh, how to engage them, uh, you know, I think the, the beginning will be made when we once, as I said, and I, I repeat myself, is when we stop depending too much on official flows. So then some more attention will go there, because otherwise we keep waiting for these official flows, multilateral banks with all their conditions, stipulations, or, you know, the aid agencies, et cetera. I think once and for all we should say that, look, there is this huge, amount of funds available, and we need to influence those to come here. And I think that will be the way to go. So you actually covered one question I was going to pose to you regarding these big funds. So let me move to my final question for the evening for you, sure. which is uh, Team India, right? Uh, India resides in its states, uh, and it's going, and it's a, it's a arc that is inevitable that uh, as greater, as states have greater agency, uh, the risks and, of course, uh, the solution will depend on state action. Do you think there is a significant gap between uh, the speak, the, 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 the posture the central government has taken vis-a-vis -vis how the states are yeah. responding to this challenge and opportunity that uh, the infrastructure growth in the age of climate change. Uh, yeah, that's uh, so, so well said. I think there's a huge uh, uh, gap here. But also, mm, the fact is that that's where rubber meets the road. I mean, if there is going to be infrastructure, green infrastructure, whatever infrastructure capability is being built, it will be built at the, in the states and very often by the state themselves, you know, and so there, uh, I'm afraid um, the the common um, sort of, uh, and I, I'm being candid here, which is that the, the you know the, the common refrain that I've heard is very often is that the green gets in the way of development, you know, and that, that's what we need to change at the state level especially. And if you look at the political class or even at the bureaucracy in the, in the states, you know, the, the green uh, this this awareness that the green and development can get together. And very often you're cited, I'm not going to name countries, but very often you're cited the examples of several other countries, you know, other than India, who have not gone the way of green and, you know, infrastructure, green and growth and green and development. And everybody says that we can also retrofit, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as others have done. After all, you know, uh, you know, Thames, uh, you know, was known to be saying that if you put your hand in it, only half a hand will come out. And now trout grows, you know, so therefore, People keep giving those examples, which I don't think are the right examples, because if India, for example, was to adopt the US model of transport and get up to 736 or 86 cars per thousand, you know, thousand people, uh, there will be no environment. You know, we can't afford that, I mean, this, you know, whatever. So uh, in the state level, I think a lot of work needs to be done, uh, starting with awareness. I think this is where a lot of uh, good money can be spent and resources can be spent in changing the mindset there, which is to say that, look, this is not a trade-off. If you clean your rivers and make them, you know, you know, and make them into inland waterways and therefore reduce the carbon print, you know, carbon footprint, then it helps you and helps infrastructure and you know, and transport and mobility. Now, this is where, and let me, let me make a quick plug for Niti, uh, this is one of the key tasks for Niti IO. So Niti Aayog, uh, two principal mandates are to push for cooperative federalism and competitive federalism. And as a result of which, for example, you just recently come out with a composite index for water. You know, and, and we have ranked the states and you talked about them and, and been very frank about the level of water stress that the country is facing. And, you know, and we're talking about this, when you talk about this mobility, we will bring in mobility in land waterways, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, here, uh, I think a lot of work that ORF could do uh, is to start identifying replicable 
replicable uh, initiatives that some states are taking and then spread them all across the country. So I think that's where, in, in, in India, some good thing is happening perhaps in every field somewhere or the other. The question is to scale that and to, is to replicate that. And, but, but a lot of work needs to be done there because there is a massive gap between the understanding in Delhi and other state capitals uh, and where, as I said, uh, principally uh, green is seen to be uh, adversely uh, you know, uh, oppo opposed vis-a-vis uh, -vis development. And I think we need to change that. Thank you very much, Dr. Kumar. Please join me in applauding his intervention this Thank evening. You.